Hi, my name is Florian Berg. Um, I'm going to present today a uh, joint work with Julian Kerbel, Anna Pavlova, and Roberta Rigobon. Personally, I'm a researcher at MIT. And the paper, the title of the paper is ESG Confusion and Stock Returns Tackling the Problem of Noise. ESG ratings are noisy. And this noisiness will actually um, bias downward the link between financial performance and ESG performance. We show that actually in a standard regression setting, so this is actually that most commonly used in academic research, those coefficients are biased downward by more than 60% due to this noise. So we propose actually a noise correction method and then also show that these ESG scores, how noisy they are. Those are our findings. Um, I hope they, they interest you. And now, actually, I'm going to tell you why we suppose that ESG ratings are noisy, or why do we know that they're noisy. First, let's look at the ESG ratings divergence. ESG ratings, between ESG raters, there's a lot of disagreement. Um, here, there's a graph that uh, shows the disagreement between six different raters. This is from our previous paper, um, Aggregate Confusion, the Divergence of ESG Ratings. And as you can see in this, what we call confetti plot, the, the assessments are all over the place. And all those ratings are normalized. So some have actually a difference of more than five standard deviations, which is very, very big. So in our previous paper, we explained this um, divergence um, with th with that it, uh, coming from three sources, scope, measurement, and weights. Scope is just um, what indicator do I measure? Um, for example, do I include CO2 emissions in my assessment or do I include um, corruption? Weights is um, the relative importance. So if I include corruption, and if I include CO2 emissions in my assessment, what is the relative importance I give um, to each of them? Because most of the, or all ESG ratings that we have in our sample are actually um, weighted averages from a different set of indicators. Indicators, some rating agencies have 40 indicators, others have up to 284 indicators. So this is actually explains less than half of the divergence between the ESG ratings. The biggest part is actually measurement divergence. Measurement divergence means um, that we rating agencies want to measure the same concept, the same, the same, um, the same attribute, but they they do it incorrectly. Um, for example, CO two emissions scope one, scope two is fairly easy to measure. Scope three is much harder because we need often um, companies do not publish anything about scope three. And if they do, they have they use different hypotheses um, to come up with those numbers, and often also averages that to proxy for a supply chain, for example, supply chain emissions. Um, same for corruption or diversity. Uh, everyone uses their own um, different data points. So um, in this sense, there's measurement error, and this is actually also hints measurement noise. Um, yeah, and so this is exactly the noise that we we are um, we are trying to correct for. So if you if you have a couple of ratings, let's say eight, because we have eight in our paper, um, the first thing you could do in order to um, reduce a little bit the noise would be taking an average between the eight, and then use that, for example, in your portfolio or use that in your um, uh, financial regression. This is not optimal. We can actually do much better, and we show that um, in our paper. One of our one one hypothesis that we have is that all ratings, even though they measure sometimes different concepts of ESG, as in um, they have different indicators, they have different weights, but they're also sometimes more focused on risk, or more focused on impact, or more on dual materiality. Um, they all have, uh, uh, in their sense, a true ESG performance. And this is actually what we use. Um, so this is what we use in order to get rid of the noise. 
So our suggestion is what we call in econometrics an instrumental variable approach. Um, there's ample literature, for example, about GDP um, um, for noise correction and so on. So we apply this actually to ESG ratings. And the way it works, it's a two-stage um, least squares. So you have a first stage regression and a second stage regression. For those who do not understand the mat math, I will actually explain it in words. So please just don't focus on the slide, but listen to me. So in academia, in order to look uh, to, um, to figure out if ESG actually ratings um, cause uh, higher returns, higher expected future returns, um, we, uh, we use a regression. We regress future expected or expected return on ESG ratings. And then we control for um, some yeah, company related financial variables, such as locks, uh, the size, the book to market ratio, the EBIT over total assets, the beta, the volatility, the momentum and industry and country fixed effects. So, but here we just use the rating um, in this in the standard setting. One assumption that we here have is that ratings are noisy, but measure the same true ESG performance. That means e each rater actually has a different concept of, of, of ESG, certainly. They also, um, not only about um, measurement, weights, and scope diversion, but also about impact versus more risk or dual materiality. But they all kind of measure some true ESG performance in that, from that perspective. And in order to, um, yeah, um, extract or find the true coefficient that shows us how much actually um, ESG performance causes over or under performance in the future. Um, I would show here. So, uh, first, um, as I said, in academia, we all we often use um, regression analysis to find out how much um, ESG actually re ESG ratings cause future return. Since we use just normally in academia, people use the just one rating that is noisy. This coefficient is downward biased, so. The link between the two that we observe is much weaker than it actually truly is when we once we get the true coefficient. In order to do so, we add actually a first step um, into so we run a two stage least square, uh, square least squares. And this first step is a regression of the rating that we use um, later in the second stage regression on financial return on the other raters. By doing so, we actually, um, and then we use the predicted value of this rater. So basically what we say is that the true ESG performance here is actually, um, is actually um, the part of the variability of one rating that you want to use um, explained by the other raters. And everything that can't be explained by the other raters is considered as noise. And the, the strength of the results is actually really surprising. Um, as I will show you, those coefficients actually double um, when we correct for noise, the true coefficients, and we extract the true coefficients. But first, let me talk about um, our rate as we have in our sample. So we use ISS, MSCI, IBA, Refinitiv, RepRisk, S&P Global, Sustainalytics, True Value Labs, and Visualiris. We have in total 140,000 firm month observations between 2020, 2014 and 2020. The good thing about our data set, it's those raters actually are quite different in the way they come up with their ESG ratings, in the way they measure. For example, S&P Global, formerly Rebecca Sam, uses mainly questionnaires that it sends out to the companies. 
Whereas MSCI does not want to send out questionnaires, so they look at CSR reports and regulatory filings more. Um, on the other hand, for example, rep risk and sustainalytics are mostly focused on media. Then we also have assumptions about modeling. How do we actually um, deal with data points that are not disclosed by companies? Refinitiv, for example, punishes those companies. MSCI says we do not want to punish them, so we model the data. Um, this also creates noise. So we then come up with an instrumental as a, a, this procedure that uh, this instrumental variable procedure and our findings are quite surprising or astonishing. Here we compare actually um, the coefficients that so uh, between standard regressions and two um, stage least squares. So the instrumental variable approach. This is the first, uh, the first column is the standard regressions. The second, uh, no, the fourth column is the coefficients of the instrumental variable approach. And we see that almost all coefficients go up. All the ones in black in bold actually go up. So 20 out of 24 coefficients go up. This is a quite a surprisingly strong result. And we see, for example, that um, MECI here is not at that noisy. Um, it only goes up from 0.18 to 0.20 in North America, in Europe from 0.2 to 0.28. Um, but in, for example, in Japan is much noisier. It goes up from 0.14 to 0.63. Uh, the other, on the next slide, actually, I will, it will be a little bit more um, visibly digestible because we just show those differences graphically. And what you see is actually, and then we sort them, and what you see is the biggest increase of coefficients is actually for TVL. That means TVL is the noisiest rating we have. Does it mean it's a bad rating? No, not at all. Because we can we use actually and we show that here in the next slide we show that actually tvl is a very good instrument rep risk very similar to that so here this table actually shows which instrument we use for which instrumented rating for which regressor um we actually the reason why we don't use some of those ratings is because they violate some assumptions. And one of the assumptions is, for example, that um, raters uh, that we control for, or we run an over-identifying restriction test, as, we, as it's called, to figure out if raters backfilled um, their data in order to increase, expose the correlation between financial returns and ESG. If we, in the presence of that, then we would, for example, reject um, uh, this instrument. There are a couple of other reasons why we would reject those instruments. So it's not necessarily said that just because we reject it, they do that. Um, but this might be a reason. And a previous paper I've also written about the Refinitiv database, for example, shows that this is actually the case. Some of the raters actually truly backfill data. Um, so, yeah, what we see here again, TVL is a really good and RepRisk are really good instruments. So let me show on the next slide um, what actually, because we show, found actually a positive um, coefficient. Oh, literally all coefficients we found were positive. That is quite surprising for financial theory. Because our model, for example, predicts that green stocks should have a higher price because people buy that because they, as a preference, they want for their, to respect so that the portfolio respects um, their values. So, but if a stock has a higher price, it should also have a low expected returns. So we should find actually low expected returns. <clears throat> the other case, why, how actually returns can, um, can be influenced by ESG ratings are one if those preferences actually, while those preferences shift 
from traditional stocks towards ESG stocks, um, those flows actually will create an overperformance. So, yeah, and we explain the positive coefficients with those with the this flow effect that the flow effect dominates actually um, the 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 first effect I call I talked about. Let's talk about the conclusion. Um, yeah, standard estimates. So what we find actually again that um, standard estimates um, of a regression analyst that looks at ESG performance on and stock returns suffers from an, what we call an attenuation bias. They are actually, the, those reported without a noise correction procedure are actually 60% lower than they would be truly if you corrected for noise. The solution here, what we propose is an instrumental variable approach. So we use ratings of other agencies to instrument a, an ESG rating and to get rid of the noise. We also show that the noise to signal ratios are quite high for most raters. And the, uh, that the attenuation bias is large and statistically significant. Thank you.